Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Unnamed Reverse Engineering Podcast. I'm Jen Castillo. And with me, hey, who's that? It's Alvaro. Woo! <laughs> we're, we're trying out new sounds here. Uh, and I guess we should welcome our guest today. Uh, <laughs> it's James, a.k.a. Bald Engineer. Hey, guys. How you doing? <laughs> Okay, Hi, did, welcome. You, did you enjoy the new opening? It's been a few months, so we figured we'd try something new. <laughs> you want to hit some other piano sounds or uh, something? I don't. I only got the four four sounds here. I'd have to upload more, I think. What 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 are the four that we have here? Is it hand claps? And... Uh, intro, <laughs> dramatic piano, drums, and ballpark. Okay. Because that's <laughs> needed on a podcast. Anyway, welcome to the Reverse Engineering Podcast. It's been a couple of months uh, for a vague definition of a couple since we last recorded. Things have shifted. <laughs> yeah, there's been uh, job changes, uh, state changes, city changes for, for Jen and myself, I think. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but we're back. Um, well, yes, we're back. Um, but if you know people who should be on the podcast, you should let us know because that'll make it a lot easier. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> back to our guest. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> James, do you want to tell us about yourself? And uh, No, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> okay, good. So that's been another episode. How, if you want to be reached, James, how can people reach you? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, so I'm a freelance content creator. Um, I'm known around the internet as Bald Engineer because I'm super clever when it comes up to naming things. Um, you've probably, if you've heard of me, you've probably watched something on capacitors or oscilloscopes, yeah. um, or embedded hardware. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I primarily make videos for the element 14 presents, uh, YouTube channel. And I write articles for hackster.io news among some other things. People that we all know. <laughs> yeah. All friends. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the reason I reached out is I recently saw your, uh, mega two project uh, come up on. I, I guess on socials, <laughs> some socials somewhere. <laughs> um, Which fresh. socials do you want to throw out some social? <laughs> what, are, what is anybody using for socials anymore? <laughs> I, you know, it's funny you say that because I, I, at this point, I just tell people I'm probably bald engineer most places because I don't, I mean, <laughs> how, how many, how many X Twitter replacements are there at this point? There's at least four I can think of off the top of my head. Five, yeah. 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 It's bad. So, but yeah, anyway, so, so I saw this project and I remember you years ago, I think talking about reverse engineering the Apple II or, or getting a schematic for it. Um, so I just, I thought it was a cool project. So <laughs> here we are. I mean, there's, there is a need for retro computer reverse engineering just to like fix, you know, fix things on aging pieces of hardware. It's and just kind of learning part from the past. Yes. Yeah, actually. That was kind of an unexpected, I'll talk about the project in just mm -hmm. a second, but since we're on this thread, yeah. that was something that I didn't, something I did not expect is that by diving into a 40 year old computer design, it helped me understand a lot of modern digital design. And then in, in parts of the project where I incorporated things like an RP 2040, being able to combine modern technology with this vintage technology, I found just presented some interesting challenges that you would have to work through. Okay. And so, I mean, a common question I get is why bother with this old stuff? And it's like, well, you can still learn a lot about it. And 8-bit computers are really great because a single person can understand the entire computer, right? From yeah. the transistors in the CPU all the way up to mm -hmm. whatever code and stuff shows up on screen. Like one person can understand all of that. Point to somebody that can hold up a smartphone and say they understand from top to bottom. Even right? a microcontroller these days, they're so oh, complex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially once you get into anything 32-bit, right? Yes. Yeah. Or let, let, let's not even talk about like tensors, anything that's like <laughs> built for... I, I, I'm not even there yet. Yeah. <laughs> not even you, uh, Alvaro? My God. I, I stay away from the tensors. It freak me out. I think you've like just lowered one notch below deity now. <laughs> <laughs> no tensors for me. <laughs> no tensors. Okay. At least so, not yet. Yeah. So, so let's let's put a pin in that because I think that 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 is a oh man, there's there's lots of interesting stuff I'm sure that you you want to tell us about that. But first, let's talk about the project itself. All right. So, about 
six years ago, I bought an Apple II GS because I wanted to relearn the Apple II platform because the last time I had touched one, I was probably in middle school. And so the two GS was, it's like, if you want to get into Apple II computing, it's a great pick because it is fully compatible with all of the 8-bit software. Mm -hmm. And then it has a whole bunch of really cool 16-bit stuff that it does. Um, And so as a hardware person, one of the first things I got after the computer was the hardware technical reference manual. Mm -hmm. And while reading it, I read that it had this chip called the Mega 2, which was, and this is Apple's words in this document, it is an Apple IIe on a chip. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I wonder if you can take one of those out of a 2GS and build a computer around it. Okay. So so then I did. <laughs> so d- d- done. <laughs> so, and that was it. <laughs> I guess we should we should go over what the differences are um, between the, the Apple IIe and the 2GS. And yeah. I guess there was the original. Um, yeah. W- w- what was kind of the... The history well, of those. Can, can you maybe like take a step back, like before we Even dive before into that, that okay. particular detail? Like, I'm just trying to like remember: is this the one with the turtle that I would walk around with, or is this like which one? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can answer one? both of those at the same time. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so if we go all the way back, the Apple II came out around 1977, and then like a year or two later, the II Plus came out. And that's Mm -hmm. way more popular than the original two. Mm -hmm. Um, Those were basically 48K machines. Um, They were built entirely with off-the-shelf logic. So they have something like 80 chips inside of them. And with the exception of the ROM chips, everything is Um, Mm -hmm. off-the-shelf. Outside of the CPU and the RAM, almost everything in it is a 7400 series logic chip. Um, AKA the big yellow book that we used to have. Yes. Yes. And it, <laughs> and, and frankly, if you go and look, if you, if you look for Apple II plus logic board design, it is a beautifully designed board given how much stuff is on it. It's yeah. just, it's unbelievable. What really blows me away about it is pin one is oriented in the same direction on every single chip. And I don't understand how they did that and then hand drew the PCB, right? That just, I, I don't get it. Maybe they hadn't, it hadn't occurred to them because they're so used to like maybe breadboards or like, look, it has to be like this <laughs> to keep kind of track of things, maybe. I don't know. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, no, I actually, I, I would actually like to, anyway, so yes, let, yes. let's okay. uh, <laughs> get back to so, the first question. So then I think it was around 82 or 83. I, I might have the year wrong. Uh, Apple introduced the Apple II E, which was a repackaging of the two plus, uh, From a technical perspective, the big difference is that they took all of those generic logic chips and condensed them into three ASICs or two ASICs and one gate array. Um, And then they also added some new capabilities that uh, you could do, like you get to 80 columns. um, And now I'm drawing a blank, but the 2E was basically, hey, let's let's repackage the 2 plus, totally backward compatible, and then have some future looking capabilities while reducing the chipset. Okay. Uh, that same chipset also got used in the 2C, which was a kind of portable version of the 2E where it had a built-in disk drive mm-hmm. um, and no expansion slots. Okay. So to answer your question earlier, Jen, um, the Turtle was probably Logo, and yes. Logo was a very popular um, application for the 2 Plus and 2E. Yeah, as part um, of like the buys that everyone did of the Apples mm-hmm. for education. Yep. Schools. In fact, this is totally side tangent, but very related. In second grade, um, we were learning how to write a paper and then type it on the computer and print it out. And our teacher did not understand how to use the computer. And so she had us using logo to type in our papers, <laughs> which kept causing problems because like, it, you know, you get like a syntax error randomly while typing a <laughs> sentence or something like that. And it was just so funny that like looking back, I was like, why did she do that? And it was probably because it was the only way she knew how to type something and then print it out. Okay. So, so that's around 1983. Mm -hmm. You've got the two E and then a couple years later, you get the two C, which is really the two E just without expansion slots. And then the two GS came out in 1986. And um, sometime between when the two E and the two GS were released, Apple started reducing that three chipset or that three chip chipset down to a one chip chipset called the mega two. 
Okay. Um, the rumors I found said that they were going to come out with a cost reduced 2E based on that chip. Oh. However, in 1984, something called a Macintosh came out. Oh. And Lisa? yeah, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's, it's not a really well-known computer. No. Um, no. Um, I, I hear it gets lots of viruses. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so somewhere in, in the release of the Macintosh, it was decided that Apple would not come out with another 8-bit Apple II. And so all the focus went on to the 2GS. And inside the 2GS was this Mega 2 chip. Now, given what I just told you, how would you guys imagine that the reason the 2GS is backward compatible is because it has an Apple IIe on a chip inside of it? I mean, that's what would make sense, but I assume right? that's not the case. Well, what's even worse is Apple's initial documentation before um, when it was still codenamed, um, when it still had its code name, uh, even said literally that. Uh, but it turns out the 2GS doesn't actually use the Mega 2 for anything. <laughs> it, it uses it to draw video modes and it uses it as an I.O. controller. So technically, it is responsible for hardware backward compatibility. But software wise, it's all done with the 2GS chipset and its firmware. Mm -hmm. And so so where I'm going with this, and I, it, I know this kind of almost sounds like it's a tangent, but no. so when I started, I was like, well, I wonder if you can take this chip out and make a computer with it. But as I started to understand how the 2GS actually used the chip, I was like, well, wait a minute. It doesn't actually use it for emulation. <laughs> and then that around that same time is when I learned the timeline of the Mega 2's development. And I got to wondering, what if it was never finished? What if one of the reasons they never came out with a cost-reduced version is because it wasn't feature complete or it had a problem and it only worked well enough to work in the 2GS as a, essentially an IO controller? Yep. And so, um, so then my project kind of shifted from, I want to build a computer around it to, I want to build a computer around it, but I want to prove whether or not this is an actual, if this was actually viable. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that is, that is like, that's like a PhD thesis in history. But computer <laughs> history is basically what you're positing here, which is interesting. <laughs> and yeah. So, so it sounds like a lot of this, uh, there was reading documentation. Is, is, is that all, I guess, readily available by the community or did Apple publish it? Yeah, well, it depends on what we call documentation. So in terms of the, <laughs> I guess I, 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 I just heard that too. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> yes, I document all my projects. <laughs> but mostly um, using video, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the Mega 2 itself doesn't have a lot of documentation. Um, uh, I had the schematic for the 2GS and I had some early um, uh, preliminary documents that sort of talked a little bit about it, but I, but I never found like an actual data sheet that told me what pin 17 is or how pin 22 works, right? It, there wasn't anything to that, that level. Um, I found lots of things where people would talk about how they thought it worked or what it did, but not like, here's the Apple tech note on this. Uh, let me back up. There were a couple of things I found tech notes on that were kind of obscure. Like there's a pin called uh, uh, Ram Bank Zero, and it's like, what is this? And there's some, I, chip, I still don't. Is it like a chip select, you think, or? Oh, well, in that case, it's, there's a special mode when the 2GS is doing its memory, memory shadowing that that pin goes active, I think. Mm. And actually, since you brought that up, or I'm kind of on that is this was the other thing that sort of led to my is, was this chip ever finished is as I started learning about it, uh, there's a handful of things on the chip that are specific to the 2GS that if you were building an actual computer around it, wouldn't make sense. And so, um, so anyway, um, like Sorry, what? I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, take it, take it, take it. Right, we're we our our stack is very deep at this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take a yeah. breath. Take a breath. I just don't. I just don't want to run into the heat. We'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, so Jen, since you you asked about the enable, that was actually my first like. So there. Okay, let me. I should back way up. The Mega Two okay. is an 84 pin PLCC. Right. Of that 84 pins. There is one one VDD and two grounds. Everything else is a signal. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Was it socketed or was it just soldered straight to the board? 
uh, they were soldered. Uh, they were soldered to the board. And uh, the two GSs I have used to have Megas soldered to the board. <laughs> used to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and for those that maybe don't know, uh, a PLCC, uh, you can actually either solder it directly to the board or insert it into a socket. It was a really versatile uh, chip mm-hmm. package in that regard. And so like in my designs, I use sockets, but I, I would like, you know, I depopulate it, put it into the socket, clean up the pins, put them into yeah. sockets. And you have like that, um, you have those two, either you can use that little pro like tweezer like prawn or you can get like the one tool that kind of pops it out on the corner yeah yeah, yeah. and and the the cheaper the tool the the less likely you should buy it get <laughs> get, get the good one um and because like even the, the the chip pullers i have really struggle with the 84 pen the, it's the it's yeah. just it's a i don't think i've a, ever worked with something that big in the PLC it's package. it's very chunky um yeah. all although sorry it's super <laughs> satisfying to to plug it into the socket. Yeah. Like yeah. it makes the most satisfying click ever. Okay. Um, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> we're doing, we're fine. We're fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Where were so, we? <laughs> so I, I'm going to, I'm going to try and see if I can traverse this stack that we built up. So we had this 84 pin PLCC. Um, the, the last question I was about to answer was, you know, what was like some of the pins? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, the one that so gave me they, the, yeah. So, the, so just to recap really quick. So you said, there's really like two ground, like a ground and a VCC pin, which was like yep. not a lot for like 84 pins, like yeah. at all. Um, and then we had that C ROM zero bank thing, and that's where yep. we left off. Yeah. And so you had brought up the, well, cause your, your, your guess was it was a chip select and that was actually, there is a chip select pin for this, um, for the mega two. Mm-hmm. And that was actually my first clue that this is not just an Apple IIe on a chip because from a functional computer perspective, there's no reason for that to exist. Um, the reason it exists is so that the 2GS's memory controller can disable the Mega 2 when it's doing the address decoding for like um, memory or IO. Well, 6502, it's all flat. So whenever it's decoding addresses, um, the, the Mega 2 has to get disabled. And that was like, that got me, that's when it started kind of hitting me and is like, wait a minute, how, why would you have that? Um, and then there's just, there's a couple of others and they're slipping my mind at the moment where it's just like, why would this exist on this chip? Um, of course, now that I said that, I'm trying to think what they were. That's okay. Yeah. You, sorry. You, you probably, co- did you, is this something that you covered in one of your videos? I haven't, uh, not yet. Uh, just, a. uh, to jump ahead, I, I'm actually probably starting in, uh, I'm working on a series of videos that goes into this design a lot deeper mm-hmm. because I haven't had a chance to dive into anything into great length yet. So um, my ultimate goal had been to write a data sheet mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> I still have page one, make a two. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as far as I got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It, it's, it's rough. Yeah, but it, yeah, writing a data sheet is hard especially one from a historical perspective which like this is kind of like another question for the stack i'm so sorry (laughs) so i do kind of have to wonder like did you know if if you tried to track down like any people who worked on this chip at all so because we'd be curious to see whether your guesses match their memory yeah Okay. Well, let, let, let's just roll with that because otherwise we'll, uh, I'm not going to, I don't remember anything I, I said already. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, or, or I'm, I'm going to take your question. I'm going to sort of um, refactor it. Um, okay. The, the ultimate problem I had was I had a really limited set of information about this chip. Literally, I knew what its pinout was. Um, at the time I was looking at it, I, I didn't even know what most of the pins did. I mean, they, they had normal enough names like address, but there was, <laughs> there's, there's one address bus, two data buses, um, uh, six clocks, five clocks, I think, uh, stuff like that where it's like, Outer okay, in. well, well, that's, that's another one thing that's interesting is the two GS, um, actually relies on the mega two to generate all of the system clocks. Um, except for the main oscillator, which runs at 28 megahertz, which goes through the 2GS's video controller, and then it gets uh, divided down to Mm 14.318. And then the Mega 2 makes the rest of the clocks. Um, And it's because that's just 
Yeah. Does it end up it, have a synchronization factor in terms of like any other interoperability, clunk synchronization across like any other chips that may be contacting potentially? Um, well, I think, I mean, I think that's how they kind of solve it because everything's phase aligned coming out of, or phase aligned to the uh, the master clock. I won't say it's coming. I mean, I guess there's a, they're, they're aligned coming out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, I think it's more of a, the mega two could do it. So they just used it to do the the clock, the you know, yeah. to break down the clock, which I'll, I'll sorry, I will tangent. <laughs> so there's a, there's this massive rumor that Apple purposely hamstring the 2GS so that it, it didn't outperform the, uh, mm, didn't Lisa? outperform the Macintosh. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I, I think Lisa would even fall in, into that. Yeah. And I, I actually, I haven't dove into it, but I think that's not true simply because Mega 2 is generating the clocks. Um, in order to be compatible with Apple II software and hardware, mm -hmm. the system clock has to have, you have to, you're going to have these hard set multiples. Mm -hmm. And in order to get from a system clock down to the 1.012 megahertz for the Apple II, there's not a whole lot of room in between. And so I, anyway. I cannot wait for you to do these in-depth videos and then on whatever social media platform you decide to just, you know, reach out to Waz and just like, am I close? Am I right? <laughs> like... So, okay. Back, Nerd snipe them a little bit. <laughs> so, so, okay. Backing up. Um, sources right. of information. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. I, this is recursive. <laughs> this is fine. This is fine. <laughs> Um, so I did actually, so I had the, I had the schematic, um, I, and then I thought about, uh, I, I had a friend that used to work at Motorola who was in the, um, basically in the power PC chip design, um, everyone remembers group. power PC, um, power PC, well, power <laughs> PC was the processor that ended up in the Macintosh, uh, for a very long time. Yep. Um, well, but was, I knew was that, but wasn't that like in the mid to late eighties onward until 2000 ish. Yep. Yep. About that time frame. Mm -hmm. Um, but the reason I reached out to him was because he worked with a lot of people at Apple during this same time period. And so I thought he might, he, he, he asked around, he got me a couple of names, but they, they were like, yeah, we didn't do anything with that. Um, and then I actually had a friend working at Apple and, um, he's like, you know, we have this internal search engine. I could just type mega two in and tell you what I find. <laughs> I was like, would you? He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will get I in like, trouble. <laughs> well, why'd and, you and, offer? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was like. Come on, man. Don't tease me like that. <laughs> and, and, and in fairness, I, I didn't push him because I got why he, he said that. I just thought it was hilarious that he brought it up and then because was like, he wants no, to keep I'm, his job. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, don't, oh, well, it would have been worse if he would have said, yeah, I found the data sheet. And then it'd be like, thanks. Can't give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Alvaro, yeah. Alvaro, one of our mutual friends who may or may not still work there, he would totally do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and I, I don't, I'm, I don't think anyone will, will pick up who it is. Cause, but he had just started working there, which was also the, he's like, yeah, I'm not even, he's like, I'm not, not going to search enough. for it. Yeah. And I, and again, I, I was, I, I got it. I just laughed because it's like, well, why did you even bring it up? So then I realized Waz actually has a public email address. Mm -hmm. And so I emailed that with some details. And within like uh, three hours, I got a response that said, hey, uh, no, nobody, nobody really knows uh, what we can do, but go check out the Mr. Project and see what they have. Um, the Mr. That? Project. <laughs> see, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Mr. Project is a FPGA project that re-implements uh, vintage computers and uh, video game systems as a FPGA. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's like lots of cores for a lot of these systems. Um, there is one, I and it's been a while since I looked, but there is one for the Apple IIe, but nothing for the 2GS. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, that's a bummer. And then 45 minutes later, I got a single sentence again that said, please try contacting so-and-so. And I just found that sort of interesting that I got a second response that was much more terse and it had a specific name. Unfortunately, that name I couldn't find. I couldn't find any contact info for. So that didn't really get, get me anywhere. Um, 
And so then I was sort of back to just scav scavenging the internet for whatever documents I could find. And then I realized at some point, it was like, I just have to start building hardware and see what this thing does. Um, and I would say around that point, that's when I stopped focusing on documents on the Mega 2. And I switched everything to how does the Apple II work? Mm -hmm. Because I realized very, very quickly that the Mega 2 has almost nothing. There's almost nothing in the 2GS design that would explain to me how the Mega 2 works. And as I started diving into schematics of the 2E and the 2 Plus, there were common signal names that started popping up that I was like, oh, okay. So that's how this works together. Okay. Um, and so the very first version, the very, so I'm going to switch over to the, the hardware I started building to, to figure out how this chip works. Mm -hmm. Cause I, cause this is, this was, this was me and how naive I was. <laughs> I made a, I opened up KiCad and I made a breakout board for the mega two. Remember I said it's an 84 pin PLCC yeah. with 81 signal pins. And my plan was to breadboard a 6502, <laughs> the CPU, mm -hmm. uh, a, a DRAM and an EEPROM onto it and see if I could make it work. And uh, I swear I got the board made, but I can't find any copies of it. But it did hit me. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to say you messed up. <laughs> well, as soon, and, and that's why I, that's why this is one of those like weird things where it's like in my mind, I remember holding the board, but I can't find it anywhere. And you only made um, one. <laughs> well, I mean, Maybe. so, but what I remember was it eventually dawned on me that there were 84 pens and I was going to breadboard to 84 <laughs> pins. Like a bigger bread, breadboard. Right. And then I was going to need a logic analyzer, probably. Right. And it's like, what was I thinking? <laughs> like, it, you can't do that. You might so, want to have some standoffs to plug in and a yeah, million saliers. <laughs> oh, my God. You, oh. The budget so, of yeah. saliers would probably have killed you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, God, and that was actually another issue I started running into is, is like, because I, I ended up doing most of my uh, debug work with a digital, uh, digital, digital discovery. Analog mm -hmm. discovery too? Uh, no, the digital discovery. Oh, okay. Because the digital discovery is like, um, it's a, it's a high speed logic analyzer. It does uh, 32, I think you can do 32 signals at once. Oh, nice. Um, there's 24 on the front panel and then an additional eight on either side. Um, and if that math gets to 32, then that's how that works. Um, and Elvaro so clearly is looking this up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and, and the reason I, I'm, I'm like, because I run into this twice, like twice I thought it could do 40 signals at the same time, but it can't. And I think it's, it's limited to 32. And I know the front panel has 24 because I'll say why in a minute. Um, so anyway, so that was, that was the very first thought I had was breadboard this whole thing and see what happens with the breakout. Mm -hmm. um, so then the next thought was, okay, well, what if I just do a minimum viable computer? So then I designed a PCB, a, a set of PCBs that used ribbon cables to connect to each other mm -hmm. so that I could get the Mega, the RAM, ROM, a CPU, and a video circuit so mm -hmm. that I could at least get to a basic boot. Mm -hmm. And that was probably where I learned the most about the Mega <laughs> 2 and the Apple II design because I don't know. Have, I have, have you questions. Ever, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was, I know, well, I, know, I think my first question is like, did you run into any impedance and matching or like, you know, lot, ah. trace length issues? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm curious so, because like, because like at the speed that we're running at, maybe not. <laughs> so here's what I find really fascinating is, uh, so it, it, I'll, the short answer to your question is, uh, not really. Okay. Um, because a lot of these signals, like, so the fastest clock is 14 megahertz, and then there's a seven meg clock and a 3.58, a uh, 2.048, and a 1.012. But, you know, clock, the clock rate is one thing. Yeah. Um, one of the problems I, I ultimately almost ran into is that my clock oscillator is ridiculously fast in terms of its rise time. Mm. And so uh, I had to... So yeah, so I had to shove it through a, um, a Schmidt trigger, and I think I even used like a set, an LS series just mm -hmm. to slow it down. Okay, because... so I don't actually know what a Schmidt trigger is, so you might have to explain that <laughs> when you finish your <laughs> sentence that I really interrupted. No, no. So so Schmidt trigger is just a so it's an inverter 
a, a digital inverter and then the input has some hysteresis on it. Okay. And so normally what you would do is you would take a really noisy signal and put it into it so that you get a clean signal out. Mm -hmm. Um, I was putting in a clean signal, but it was just really fast. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a slower signal out. And so um, so I did that to slow down the edge a little bit. So and kind then, of like a high pass filter on it, effectively. Um, or sorry, a low pass low, filter. Low pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There I go um, doing subtractive synthesis again. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, I, I will never pass EMI on any of the stuff that I did. So <laughs> <laughs> just, I was actually... <laughs> I've sometimes wondered how, how many times I've had random things happen in the lab because of some of this stuff. Um, <laughs> it's just you your mega like, two. In my head, I'm like, like what kind of random stuff, like a cabinet opening or, <laughs> 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 or suddenly a sandwich appearing on your desk, like that kind of weird or something else. <laughs> Man, if, if that was the case, then we would have a totally different conversation. <laughs> Because that would be, imagine um, inventing that. <laughs> Teleporter, like the sandwich, pseudo sandwich delivery machine. <laughs> yeah, pseudo sandwich delivery. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, the, 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 what I, an interesting thing that I found. So I had that issue with the oscillator because it was the only one I could find at the right frequency. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that I found interesting is that the Mega 2 itself has a ridiculously slow rise time commensurate of hc series logic of the time okay so like 7400 series chips they came in like ls hc hct lvt all kinds of families okay. and each family has some characteristics associated with them um in this time frame hc was like the fast stuff that was affordable and so so what was interesting is some of the timings of the Mega 2 are actually slightly slower than the original Apple IIe just because of the integration technology that they yeah, used. Yeah, whatever process they used. And right. And, and you know, it's not as, it wasn't as good as, say, like a 14-pin dip that you make a ton of. Um, so anyway, so I only mentioned that because it was really interesting because when I look at stuff on the scope, it's like I can tell where, like, just poking at it, I can basically tell by the, just looking at the edge. It's like, oh, that's one of my one of my logic chips that I added, or it's the mega two is clearly driving that one just yeah. because the shape Slow. is so different. Mm -hmm. um, but, Slopey. but in general, but outside of that in general, signal integrity was never a concern. Um, um, if you watch either of the, the two videos I've done on the project, you'll see what ultimately ended up becoming rev one where it's literally just a pile of wires. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't signal integrity was the problem. It was wire integrity was the problem. Yeah. It wiggling um, all over the place. Did you hawk? Well, and, and breadboard wires are notoriously bad, right? Yeah, yeah. It's hard to keep it neat. Did you call, did you nickname that Rev1? Harry? Maybe? Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> Harry. <laughs> well, no, uh, actually throughout this, I, I, yeah, I had Rev0, which never really did anything. Uh, that was the breakout board. Rev1 was the three board design. Uh, Rev two is a modular design that I did, and then Rev three is the final, okay. um, the final PCB. Well, congratulations! <laughs> Does that sound easy? Because I saw I saw the video on that. I was like, okay, but didn't have much of appreciation for what you went through. <laughs> it, it, in which iteration did you put a, saw, a header for the discovery board? Mm -hmm. So that was in the second iteration. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so just to, just to highlight, so rev one was my, my primary goal was get to an Applesoft prompt because then I knew that the mega two was at least partially functional, mm -hmm. um, which I got there. Um, and then, um, on what I realized after that is I needed to understand the Apple two circuit way better than I did, uh, because I was using the Apple two ROM, I was using their chip and I had no idea what any of the signals were doing. Right. I was just like, I, I don't know what's going on here. And yeah. so I, in Rev2, I built this modular platform where I could basically build blocks of the Apple II circuit as a card and plug it into a black backplane. Um, and then that way I could probe whatever I wanted. And it was super easy and well, not quick, but super easy to say, <laughs> respin a board instead of like, originally I was going to make this massive monolithic thing. And I realized, well, but if I have to make a correction, that that's going to be a waste. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, so Rev2, when I did the backplane, I was like, you know what, what if I just plug the digital discovery directly into the backplane and then have it just probe the address and data bus all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that made debugging with a logic analyzer ridiculously easy. Like, mm 
I'm kind of mad that it's taken me this long in my career to ever think to do that. Yeah. Like, it, does, it's, it's such a useful thing. We, we, uh, we actually use the analog discovery too at a previous job just mm-hmm. for, for automating, uh, test dev boards, right? Like mm-hmm. we would plug it in and you have two oscilloscope inputs, you have 16 mm-hmm. IOs, and then we use the IOs to con- to control some analog switches, uh, to, or muxes to route different signals to the oscilloscope so that we can automate different measurements uh-huh. and stuff. And, and the Python API, and I assume it's the same one, is pretty easy to use. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually the, uh, I mean, just just because I do get a lot of test equipment for free, I just want to point out that I have both an analog discovery too and a digital discovery, and I bought them both myself, and I will still sing their praises for as long as I can. Um, Digilent did a fantastic job with the waveform software because throughout the project, I actually swapped back and forth between the two mm-hmm. um, until Rev2. Well, I mean, in Rev2, I basically stuck with the digital, digital discovery because mm-hmm. it was plugged into the board. Mm-hmm. But the the software, is so it, it's so great because you can just swap between whatever you need. Um, so anyway, yeah, so Rev2 is when I did that. And that's when I did probably the bulk of what I would call reverse engineering. That's where I spent a lot of time uh, poking at registers, watching stuff on the logic analyzer, and just trying to understand how how much of the Mega 2's behavior was the same as the Apple IIe's behavior. Um, did, did you have an Apple IIe uh, reference to compare with, or were you using the FPGA synthesized? Uh, so I, ha- I have a real Apple IIe, and I made a couple of interposer boards with these really cool Samtech uh, pins that are really small, so that they can plug into a, um, a dip socket without deforming this the socket uh but if you look at them too hard they break off so are they um, like are they were they like ziff ones or because i love saying uh, stuff but they yes they are expensive yeah i don't i don't remember the series name i'm maybe for show notes i'll find them but they're they're they're, they're basically um yeah they're, they're just really small pins that allow they're just the right what i'll what i'll call the right diameter to fit mm-hmm. into a regular dip socket and so on my 2E, on a couple of the chips, I removed them and then I put a socket and then I had this interposer board I could plug in if I wanted to make measurements. Just to sniff the signals, basically. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, yeah. It, yeah, and I actually, I didn't need to do that as often as I thought I did, um, but I did definitely poke around my 2E, I mean, very, very often with the scope because, you know, for example, like the clocks thing, it was like, I was trying to figure out who generates the clocks and how. And that's where I was like, okay, well, even in the two E schematic, it's not clear to me which of these two, there's two chips that have clock signals on them. And it wasn't clear to me who generated it. And so, you know, I had to go and poke that and see how that works. And then that told me that for sure that the mega two was going to generate that clock. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so yeah, so I had a real two E to help try to understand the, the other thing that it was helpful for was looking at registers. Uh, It turned out that even though there's really good emulators for like, you know, to run on your PC, they don't, their registers aren't always the same as the real hardware. Mm-hmm. And that was really frustrating because <laughs> I thought I had figured something out. And then when I went to try it with the mega, I wasn't getting back what I expected. And then when I tried it on the two E, it worked more like the mega. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, what is going on? Yeah, here? It's not, it's not registered compatible, I guess. Or... It just feels yeah. like it's somewhere in between. Like you, like this, pro- this product is like, like split between worlds. It sounds like. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was well, and that that's actually that that really really was the the case. Like, um, well, okay, so uh, yeah, so Rev two was that. Um, we and we can go deeper into that, but the videos really cover yeah. what happened yeah. with Rev two quite well. Yeah, we'll link to those. Um, and then Rev three was basically take all of those things and turn them into a PCB. And mm-hmm. if I now, I just want to point this out before I make this comment. Uh, by this point, I've done I had done over twenty different PCB designs for various, to test various things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I, if I, if I thought about what was the one skill or thing I did throughout the project, it was, okay, well, I'll just design a board to do that. Um, I've, I didn't realize this, but I, you know, I went from, I'm going to use a breadboard for everything to, I made a custom PCB for everything and I barely touched my breadboards and that's probably going to stay the way that way for a long time. I it, no, it's, it's a game changer. Are you doing also, uh, did you hand solder those or did you have those pre-assembled? Uh, I, I did all hand, um, hand oh, okay. assembly. Um, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I, I, I really worked on this most like the, the hard, the, the core of the project. Yeah. I worked on it during COVID 
and I was doing live streaming uh, yeah. while doing it. Uh, and so stuff like soldering the boards made for really good live streams. And yeah, so I chat and it's so yep. ASMR for mm-hmm. people. Like, oh, and and it's and it was so easy to like interact yeah. with people while you know doing it. So well, except when using hot air <laughs> <laughs> or burning yourself. Oh, or... I melted the connector. <laughs> No, the, you know, I got I got the best tips when I burned myself. So <laughs> that was a that was a really bad you mean, don't do association. That. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. It's like, ow, oh, what do you know? They gave me money. <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> he's, gonna, he's gonna need medical care for this. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, Electro Boom has made a living out of that one. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, because I just is that uh, the guy that like electrocutes himself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, you mentioned making custom PCBs instead of just lots of wires and, and yeah, it's such a game changer now that you can have them in, a, in like a week, same week, order PCBs, have them. And I think that saves more time and frustration <laughs> than that, people realize that that was, I, 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 I'm just going to end up repeating what you said. Um, that was, I think this project helped me realize that because, um, that that was sort of like it's like okay well i'm going to make this pcb it'll take me two days and then while i'm waiting the five days for it to come back i can go work on this right Mm -hmm. versus spending a week trying to breadboard something and And screwing it up screwing it up yeah it's it's not like a oh i'm getting work work done week it's like no what's not what's wrong well okay so let's let's kind of draw it back to 1983 84 where they were doing copper clad like et- etching <laughs> potentially for their first pass and then i don't know how how many thousands of dollars that it would take just to fab one board because i remember like in the late 90s we did a run of boards not very big like maybe like a large coaster for a drink and mm-hmm. that engineer screwed them up and that those 10 boards were i think five thousand dollars yeah, so. now it costs five dollars. You know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's faster. Yeah. It is faster. That it's it's yeah. It's such a m- mental tweak about how quickly we can do this stuff now. Yeah, you know, I I was I was also thinking about design review. How much, um, how how much of the of a design review has just become a design rule check? You know, it's all yeah. automated. Oh, DRC is great. Right? You know, and it's like, yeah, you still, you know, on a large expensive project, you're still going to sit down as a team and look through things. But, you know, a lot of that, what used to spend days doing, you know, yeah. you just hit a button. It's like, oh, just move it a little bit more. <laughs> it's easy. Close, or or you, didn't, you forgot to connect the thing to the other thing, right? Like you, you mislabeled one side of the connection and then it says, hey, this is this unconnected. And I'm like, no. It, oh. oh, you didn't put a yeah. no connect on this. Yeah. I, I mean, I have to say like my from my perspective, since I haven't done any boards in a while, but like sitting in on the reviews regularly, like, yeah, there's very like for software, we're mostly like, why did you pick the wrong part for this? <laughs> it's like so or like if we're lucky, we look <laughs> right. at the layout like, are you sure you meant to do that? But I also want to say for for folks uh, who might not know it, but like uh, I had a contract gig uh, last year um, that I I needed to have a bunch of dip sockets just for reasons. And it was going to (laughs) be like, yeah, like over a dozen of these. And and then I just started thinking like how long I'm going to spend soldering. And then JLC PCB soldered everything for me Mm -hmm. for pennies Mm -hmm. and shipped it. And in a week I had a, full board that's fairly large, full of socket. Everything was already put in there and I didn't have to solder a a single thing. That's amazing at like, as far as I'm concerned, like that, that's such a, I mean, I would have paid more for it just because I mean, I was billing for the time. It's still worth it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I think I, I I feel like this has only been in the last couple of years, like Mm -hmm. through hole soldering is now, affordable through these yeah. assembly houses. Somehow. Like, you know, I'd say for like for five, almost 10 years doing surface mount assembly was, I, w- I would say it was reasonable cost. I mean, it, it, you know, there was a lot more setup work that was yeah. involved than there is today. But so if it was, if you had something that was all surface mount, it was like, yeah, you know, it's probably worth spending the hundred dollar setup fee or whatever it used to be. And now it's like, okay, well, yeah. Like it, it, it's funny because I'm actually doing a couple of board designs at the moment. And it's like, yeah, I'm not going to solder these. I'm, I'm just going to have yeah. let them do it. Um, but 
but yeah, so for, for the, for the entire project, I, I assembled all the boards myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, and I still haven't run out of a roll of solder. I don't, I, I don't think it's <laughs> possible <laughs> for so long. Yeah, I don't no, I understand. Still... Like, and, and there were like twice in the project, I thought it was about to run out and then it's kind of I mean, like the sandwich thing. Kilo, it's it's right? like, like a Hana, it's like a Hanukkah miracle. <laughs> it just, I just don't get it. I, I, it's like, I cannot yeah. get rid of this roll. <laughs> I, I want to know where all of those boards are right now. Like, are they in a box? Are they going to be on display somewhere? Um, mm. yeah. So actually somebody on YouTube gave me a great idea. Uh, I'm going to make, um, like a, a light block box display for mm -hmm. rev one, mm -hmm. two, and three and just have like, like that um, over there. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's a nice touch. Alvaro. Look at you decorating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's actually, how that's... it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's that was a great question that you asked for some reason. <laughs> for those okay, that don't know, Alvaro has chair for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Alvaro has some really nice light boxes in his yeah. background with um, with uh, PCBs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's um, about all I have in my walls right now. Yeah, it actually it actually works out because a lot of the boards I did, I did them through Oshpark. So even the ones I used, yep. I actually have only one because I, I always solder at least two. Yes, yeah, and one so, spare. Right. And so I've got all these spares. It's like, I don't know what to do with them. It's like, yeah, I think I'll make a little art display out of them. Mm -hmm. I've done um, drink coasters in uh, resin and then mm -hmm. I've done yep. the shadow boxes. And, and yeah, both, I like that just, idea too. Just don't do what I did. Like a long, long time ago, I had a bunch of extra PCBs and I just like mosaic them onto a coffee table and just sealed mm -hmm. that up. It's still rusted. <laughs> oh, no. Ooh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 But that's fine. No yeah. Problem. No, that's, yeah. I Must have been hassle, I, not Enag. See, this that, was like early 2000. And those boards probably came from the 90s or, and even yeah. 80s. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very tinny. Yeah. <laughs> so. So anyway. Anyway. Your project. <laughs> <laughs> not the random shit that we're putting around our, well, our you know, I was going to, you know, I was going to, so I was going to tie up on the, the rev three thing. Um, so I, I do recommend people watch the video cause you'll get to see, you know, a lot of times in project videos, you know, everyone's always like, and then I did this and it works great. Um, this was a project where things did not work great. Great. And I, that was, I, I'm, I, for some reason, I just felt compelled to make that the focus of the video. Like, I appreciate it's like, that. you know, it's like, here are, and every problem I had with it was a stupid thing that I did. Like, and that, that was probably the most frustrating thing about Rev3 was everything wrong with it was my mistake. And part of it was I was rushing. I was like, oh, I want to get this done and, and I'm just going to go for it. And, um, I mentioned earlier that I live streamed most of the project. Mm -hmm. Um, the part that I had the most trouble with was, the only thing in the well, one of the only things in the schematic that I did not live stream, oh, and yeah. I I'm I I kicked myself because the chat would have caught it. They they always <laughs> caught the mistakes that those kinds of mistakes. Um, but I was going to kind of uh, connect back to you know we talked about PCBs back in the eighties. You know one one thing that didn't escape me as I was um, as I was working on the design for the Rev three board is. Mm -hmm. I basically designed an Apple II computer by myself. Now I want to be careful when I say that because a lot of people <laughs> helped me and I'm yeah. not trying to take credit for the help that yeah. I got. I just meant as a, as a, one individual sitting down with KiCad, I designed a computer, right? Yeah. Which and is I did it in, cool. right? That's amazing. And, well, and, and I did it in a relatively short period of time versus, you know, I, I probably did this whole project in about the time that a design went from start to finish. Now, granted, I was looking at what they did before and trying yeah. to adapt it to slightly changes, but still just the, the amount of resources we have compared to 30 years ago. Right. Oh, God. I mean, just KiCad on its own is already a fantastic tool that we all have access to. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I think the, you know, the, the something that I really learned about and we, we sort of dance around this is it's like, yeah, why not just build a little test card to do the one thing you need to do mm -hmm. because it's easy to do it. It's cheap. And then you have a tool. So yeah. exactly. And, 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 and other tools, um, the RP 2040, right? Like that, that's kind of a wonderful IO device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that, that's my, it, it's, it's become my favorite microcontroller. Um, the mega two has two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them does USB video or USB video. <laughs> I'm dying to know what that looks like. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, I, I was actually, I had initially thought to do that. Mm. Um, and then I realized it was only full speed. I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, so that's, that's not going to work. Uh, but yeah, so it does one RP 2040 does the, um, it's, 
it's the USB keyboard host. Mm -hmm. And it also is it, I'm using it as a PIMIC or a, yeah. um, a power, uh, power, yeah, power management, management. IC. Yeah. And then another one captures the digital video data from the mega two and creates VGA out of that. Which so. is already pretty cool. Yeah. I, I love it. it. It's so pretty. It's, it's so, <laughs> it's just so clean. Um, yeah. I just so. saw a Kickstarter about a, it was like a TFT display that takes in all sorts of different retro video formats and displays it. And it looks like a CRT. Um, I'll have to post like a, a CRT to that. or an Amber vision or a, well, it, 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 so it's not a CRT, right? It's still a flat yeah. screen, but it's, it's thicker and it looks kind of a CRT, but in the back they have different modules for every kind of obscure video input from retro computers. So people yeah. can still use them. Yeah. Um, in a relatively, with it, with them. Yeah. Um, similar way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest problem with doing this retro computer stuff is that, yeah, they're all composite signals, but none of them do it right. Yeah. And yeah they, they, all, have they all had their own thing. The, yeah. And they all do it wrong to a certain degree, which is one of these. Uh, so one of the cool things about the mega two is it actually outputs, even though it, it outputs digital video information. Um, and so anyone that remembers the characteristic rainbow effects of an Apple two, like you'd look at text and it'd have this rainbow effect. Um, Technically, the Mega 2 doesn't generate those because it never goes through a composite circuit, but it actually simulates the effects so that it looks correct. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of one of those things that it wasn't until like, this was like way late in the project. I was looking at the screen one day on, in VGA. And I was like, wait a minute. Why do I have a rainbow effect? It's like, looks too good. It's like the only analog here is VGA and it, it doesn't work the same way that composite video did. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. That's one question. How many more? Do <laughs> <laughs> so, Whoops. so if you had to, if you had to go back and like pick like the biggest challenge, because I, I think maybe we've already touched upon it, but like, like if you had to pick one challenge. Yeah. That, so I think for, for me, the biggest challenge, and like, I was thinking about this in terms of other, like, you know, reverse engineering, pro like, yeah. um, uh, projects is I did not know if the mega two was fully functional mm -hmm. until I knew it was fully functional. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's an all and or so nothing every, thing. <laughs> right. And so every time I had a roadblock, I didn't know, was it that I did something wrong or did I just not understand something yet or did it not work? Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly frustrating because I didn't have anything to tell me that, yes, this should work. Um, you know, just a, I won't go into detail, but for example, getting the, getting access to disk drives, mm -hmm. um, took me way longer than I, it should have, because I couldn't figure out how to access it. And it's because it's, well, it is documented somewhere. I found it in a, in a long list of, um, registers on how to enable and enable, uh, access to the slots. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I was like, okay, well, is this just something that I can't figure out how to do? Or is it something that the mega can't do? Right. And that was, that was probably my biggest challenge was yeah. I didn't know if the thing that I was trying to accomplish was possible. Mm -hmm. um, not that was I able to do it, just whether it was possible. Yeah. At all. Can the chip do it? Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. But it can. Turns out it can. There's, there, there is only like one thing it can't do. Um, and it's something that's, it's in the 2GS manual. The, yeah. the two, there, there's some video mode that the Mega 2 doesn't support, but nobody uses it. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So, so says the Apple documentation for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Very explicitly. I mean, and and then like, let's go back to something that you said, like I think uh -oh. over half an hour, forty five minutes ago, maybe. I don't know. We're 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 coming Yesterday up morning. on. Hello, I'm James. <laughs> <laughs> Play the piano. <laughs> Hit him with the piano. <laughs> uh, you you said that you know why bother looking? We kind of talked about what people asking why would you bother looking at any of this old stuff? Was there anything about the architecture that you saw that seemed to be different from other computers that seemed to really di differentiate itself from modern computers, or do you kind of see this history, this lineage um, that ends up influencing modern computers? That's a that's a good question. Um... I think if you look at any of these 8-bit computers, sure, there's some blocks there that you could say are technically in modern computer or computing devices. Mm -hmm. um, what I Probably what I found the most interesting is 
and this is not related to my project, but the okay. Apple II E and the Apple II GS. Um, most people, especially schools, bought this two GS and used it to run Apple II software at in schools. And when you really look at the two GS's design, there are elements in its design that are in desktop computers today. And it just blows my mind how the Macintosh was set up as the future of computing. And I think eventually we got there, but the two GS in 1986 was already more advanced than PCs that would come like almost 10 years later Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of, I would say overall architecture or functionality or features. And it just, that, that, that's one thing that just kind of, it, it's like, wow, we didn't really, we, we didn't really appreciate what the machine was at the time because it was backward compatible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know if that actually answers your question, but it does. I that, mean, that, it, you know, it, go ahead. Oh no. I was just going to say that like, you know, it's kind of like the, the Amiga, which is not the same mm-hmm. thing as an Apple, like also was very much ahead of its time and yet didn't really survive, make a, other than amongst nerds, make any sort of impression with the yep. general public, um, kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I would say because I think I think the Amiga, the two GS, is probably around the same time time frame. You know, kind of same generation. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting if you look at that generation of computers because that's where I think you really see the roots of modern computer computing devices. Um, I really feel like these eight bit machines were just let's let's slap a little bit of memory on a microcontroller and <laughs> and call it a computer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, um, run basic. Yeah. Our previous one of our previous guests, I'm trying to remember her name, who was doing retro computer virus. Uh, Nika. Nika. Yeah. Um, also kind of felt very, that it was very interesting to see like how past ex like all the exploits that were found in these retro computer viruses are still the same mm-hmm. things that are showing up today to d- in today's computer viruses <laughs> like the 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 core signatures are the same it's just mm-hmm. the the actual well, vector is slightly different yeah. yeah and 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 now that we have microcontrollers everywhere some of the attacks that worked on a 8 bit machine mm-hmm. from the 80s or 90s uh, might also be uh, valid on some of the microcontrollers because people weren't thinking security in microcontrollers until recently. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, we slapped a an IoT module on there. So yeah. good job. <laughs> and now it's online. <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? I don't see it. That way. Come, on. Come on. <laughs> it's su- super easy. Okay. Well, kind of closing out this project, I mean, were there any particular skills that you had to develop, perhaps unexpectedly? Um, I, I actually wrote down a whole lot of things. I'm going <laughs> to, Oh no. <I'm, laughs> okay. As quickly um, as you po- I, okay. I, 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 I tell you what, I, I, I just wanted to mention this because mm. this, this touches back to why bother doing something like this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is not me trying to humble brag. I just want to point out that here's the things that I actually had to get better at to finish this project. Um, so programming the RP 2040 in C, even though I've been doing C for a long time, I had to get much better to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote several Python utilities with GUIs. Mm -hmm. Um, I got very good at 6502 disassembly. Um, (laughs) I finally understood how to do math, uh, hex math for memory maps. Mm -hmm. Um, In the digital waveforms for the logic analyzer, I had to write some JavaScript to create a custom decoder. Uh Um, I finally learned how to use peek and poke correctly in basic. Um, okay. We'll right. have to explore that. <laughs> that, that well, yeah. Correctly then, is a weird. <laughs> yeah. then, then I mentioned, you know, like if I think about um, my, my ability to use KiCad at this point has gone, I don't know, orders of magnitude yeah. better. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, again, not trying to humble brag, but I just kind of look at some of the boards that I can turn out in a day. Now I, I can see people spending weeks doing, um, and it's just, it, <laughs> Well, and, and it's just, you know, now that I've spent thousands of hours doing it, it's like, okay, here, I yeah, know that's called practice. Yeah. You're, you're um, feeling that investment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but the re the, the real thing, the actual thing I learned was how to break up a project into reasonable work time chunks. So since I was live streaming, I, I generally live streamed for about four hours. Mm-hmm. And so every single time I would like get ready for the stream, I try to pick a four hour task that I could do in that that chunk or something that might be eight hours or 12 hours so that it could be broken up over a couple of streams. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised by, by the end, I got really good at, I could kind of pick, okay, here's what I'm going to do today and then get to that point within three or four hours. 
wow. uh, versus at the beginning of the project, you know, it's like, oh, I'm just going to design this uh, real quick breakout board. It should only take 20 or 30 minutes, you know, <laughs> like three weeks later, I'm still doing it. So just time management. Um, yeah. So just, just, yeah. Time management. Now I'm not good enough at this yet that I can tell anyone else how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so don't ask. <laughs> but, Cause I was going to ask, but now I know not to. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, the, the only, I don't even think, I mean, the only practical thing I can tell you, and this isn't very useful is you just have to learn to scope better. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. don't, don't scope something. And I mean, we all hear this all the time, but I'll say it just so we hear it again. You know, you, you really need to scope something in terms of what can get done, not what you want to get done. That's mm-hmm. such right? a hard distinction when yeah. you're planning. Well, yeah. So and especially you when you're excited. Would you? Well, I think the excitement part is like, like at least when I, w- with engineers, I sense is that we, we really want to do this thing from scratch because we haven't done it before, as opposed to whether it's actually needed. Or, or that, just like, oh, I, I really want to get this breakout board done today. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, it, right. it's not thinking like, oh, wait, it has 81 signals. It has this and that. Right. You're not looking at that. You're just like, oh yeah, I can, I can do that. And it's like, no. Mm-mm. Yep. There, there's also, yeah, I think, I think it's both of those things. And there's also a small element of the, you know, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Um, you know, it's, you, and I know, I, I'm sure we all have this problem. It's like, well, if I just spend one more hour on this and then It'll that one so hour turns better. into, right. It, but then it turns into three hours. And at the end of the day, you're the only person on earth that will notice that the font sizes match all the silk screen, right? Oh, I, like, I've learned how to do that in batch and KiCat now. <laughs> Oh, okay. Did you write, did you write a gist on that or? No, well, I used to do it in a text editor, but now there's a oh, menu. God. There's a <laughs> menu option. Yeah, there's there's uh, KiCat Seven now has the the okay. menu that you can say, hey, resize all um, uh, reference okay. designators. Okay. Yep. And boom, 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 and it ah, oh, so nice. Yeah. Nice. Now, now now you just have to remind yourself not to bother doing that until you get done. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah Cause yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. don't, don't change it till just, just do it when you're done. So now I hide the reference yep. designator. I had the silk screen <laughs> until the end. So I do all my placement of all components. And then when I, once I'm done routing, I'm done everything. Then I run DRC. It gets really mad because all the silk screens right over yep. each other. <laughs> and, you and, don't then know. I, and then I place it. No, no, it's, 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 it's just don't yeah Like James saying, don't waste time with the details until it's time mm-hmm. for them. If they're, it's time for them. Sometimes like, I just don't have them. Okay. You, you know, Alro, after this project, I, I've gotten so much more disciplined about that now. Like mm-hmm. in the beginning, the, when I first started doing this, I would still mess with the silk screen. And I and I remember saying on stream, as I'm clicking around, <laughs> I shouldn't spend time doing this right now. It's like, <laughs> so then why are you? And and now I do the exact same thing. As I, one of the first things I do is I hide the silk layers yeah. because- they're, it's not your problem just, right now. They just don't matter. Yeah. Okay. Yet. Yeah. 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 No, I, I've, I've had to do some larger boards uh, recently and, and yeah, it's just like, nope, not let me, think about let it. me, let me, let uh, me reach out to you when I need to hire like, you know, consultants for, for something. Cause I know you're not going to waste time. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> oh, for consulting projects. No, those have to look good. No. Yeah. <laughs> Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> no, no. For, I mean, that, for consulting, that's where I was like, Hey, it, it'll be cheaper. And faster if I have JLC make it for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's actually when when I don't when when it's when it's somebody else is paying for it, I definitely would rather have it assembled because that's I can't oh, make the cost that I could. Yeah, time no, your time too expensive. Way more than, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd rather rework rework the problems I introduced instead of uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shall we? S- Switch topics, Alvaro. Well, let's go back another blast from the past here. Uh, I was I was reading uh, your website and some of your projects, mm-hmm. and, and I came up with this thing called Unit Blue. Can, can yeah. you tell us about this? Yeah. So I, when when you brought that up in the notes, I I really did laugh out loud because I was like, "Whoa, I forgot <laughs> that that's on my website." <laughs> it looks like you have to update um, your website. Um, so the, so Unity Blue was a project I did with a friend uh, back in the early 2000s. And what we wanted to do was <laughs> something about me and retro. Uh, we wanted to be able to use retro video game system co- uh, controllers um, on PCs with emulators uh, over USB. And, you know, this was still early 2000s. So USB wasn't... That was it, new. 
<laughs> New -ish. Yeah, I mean, it was it was starting to be like, okay, pretty much everything came in serial and USB, right? You had there that little like plug little... that you would put on there to convert it and... Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, stuff like that. And so, um, so yeah, so I found Cypress at the time, and I think they still have this family. They have the Easy USB, yep. which was essentially just an 85 or um, an 8051 microcontroller mm -hmm. um, with a handful of GPIOs and a USB Fi. Uh -oh. um, the really weird thing about the chip was it didn't have any internal flash, and I don't even think it it might have connected to an external flash with I squared C, but it got its firmware from the PC's driver. And so <laughs> it, it had like a little bootloader. And then when it enumerated, the driver would actually send the the hex file mm -hmm. for, for the 8051, um, mm -hmm. which was, I thought was super cool. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I realized I lost the files for it. Oh no! And one day somebody emailed me and was like, hey, did you... Uh, did you bank this? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, I have the drivers. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I will gladly take a copy of the drivers because I don't, I didn't have them. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so it was USB on one side, it was HD 15, like the VGA connector mm -hmm. on the other side. And then it would connect to uh, cables that I made by hand that would adapt to the uh, video game controllers. And so I bought like extension cables, cut them in half and mm -hmm. wired them up. I have quite, well. I have two comments. One one is a comment that yes, Cyprus then like eventually has their version of the wireless USB, mm -hmm. and that does have internal flash memory, albeit not much. I think it's at the most eight kilobytes total for that, and Man. it's useful for mice and keyboards and what have mm -hmm. you. And then the second thing is. Why did you want your hands to hurt so much? None of those controllers were like ergonomic in the slightest, and you know you at always the had time? those hot, at those hot, like especially the 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 Nintendo, the original Nintendo NES. console. Like it's like it just, I just remember thumbs. My thumbs hurt go. so bleeping much. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I only wanted it for the Super Nintendo controller, oh, which yeah, yeah. I still think is a really Slight, good one. Slightly more ergonomic. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, no, like, um, like I've got the NES controller and I hate using it. It just, it's, I only like it for about 10 minutes and it's like, yep, I remember being a kid playing Super Mario and this is, this is, this is all I want. Yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. that's. Were all the pinouts and interfaces documented at the time or did you have to figure that out? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think there were, a, there were so, like a handful of text files I could find for some stuff, um, but I spent. <laughs> I spent a lot of time with um, a scope and logic analyzer, uh, which was hilarious because I worked at Agilent at the time and I had the uh, 16700, um, which was this massive uh, logic analyzer we used to debug PCs. And um, <laughs> that's what I was using to, to look at. <laughs> yeah. Was this yeah. the one that was running Windows CE or, or ME? Um, yeah. No, this was, th so the 16700 was, um, it was actually a HP UX on okay. a uh, PA risk processor. Oh, wow. Um so and really, then, really old. <laughs> the really old ones. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they didn't replace that until almost 2010 with a PC. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it was pretty close to 2010 before it got replaced. Mm -hmm. um, that that's that that that's a different podcast. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I just it was just massive overkill for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, yeah, so I had to like look at how the controllers were working. I think the most interesting to me is the Sega because it has the three and six button version, mm -hmm. and the uh, the select button. I think I think it's the start button or the no, it has a mode button, and the mode button changes the way that the the controller behaves. Mm -hmm. And so if if you're not ready for that, it because like it, it starts multiplexing the it's button like a, presses. Yeah, it's like a, it's a modifier. Basically. Yeah, and it's just it's just it's not as straightforward as like say like the NES controller or the SNES where it's just a shift register. Mm -hmm. um, you actually have to keep track of what mode you're in so that you know whether the the buttons are being multiplexed or not. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not like ABC is multiplexed with uh, XYZ it's, either. Uh, it's something it's something else. yeah. What, did you do N64 as well? Um, no, and not, not at the analog, time. Right? Um, well, I think that still has a, I, don't know if I it's think a it has, or... it, it has, it has the analog controls, but I think it's still a digital, um, I think it's all transmitted digitally. Ooh. Um, 
but I I didn't at the time because N sixty four was actually still kind of it was hard to emulate. Thing. Yeah, I mean, even today all, the emulation is not great. All of that MIPS on all that stuff. Yeah, that's that's how MIPS survived for so long. <laughs> I mean, all consoles, that sweet, yeah, all that sweet Nintendo money for for a good decade <laughs> plus from from MIPS. Well, wasn't wasn't the first PlayStation a MIPS? Nope. Or was it something different? Mm -mm. It was okay. A, I, okay. I don't remember what they were. Someone quickly look it up. Look it up. PlayStation console uh, processor uh, SPC seven hundred. No, yeah, uh, SPC. No, that's a Nintendo. SPC is Spark. Uh, but that's for Nintendo. Which is, which is also MIPS. <laughs> Oh, this is great. I thought it was, oh man, it's not super H. Like, it, uh, I feel CPU like. CPU R3000. R3000. Oh, uh, that is MIPS. It is MIPS, yeah. I had no idea. There we go. Boom. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't have a, I didn't ever have that. But I don't, I don't remember that ever being mentioned when I worked for MIPS. Like, the sweet, sweet PlayStation money it was always the sweet, sweet arm. Uh, sorry. Nintendo money. Yeah, I wonder if that was still a period where, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna, I don't want to speculate about things <laughs> I don't know. Well, there was another company called Gyrations who, that's how they ended up surviving a bit longer, is by having the patent for the gyroscope, um, and and patent for Air Mouse specifically, mm, and that's yeah. how that's how they managed to last when the Wii came out. Okay, yeah, I remember that because there's like that big legal thing, and mm -hmm. they uh, they. Didn't they get a bunch of patent money because of the Wiimote? Yes, they did. And that's how they survived a little bit yeah. longer. And then eventually they got bought up by, they they changed their name to Movea and then they got bought up by um, <sighs> Invincence, who now got bought up by TD, <laughs> yeah. TDK, is it? I don't remember. Yeah, uh, T yeah TDK has them. Yeah. Um, I used to, when, when I worked at the capacitor company and since i was in the component world i used to keep a chart of all of these acquisitions mm -hmm. and uh eventually i just gave up and just drew crayon all over it because i'm like it just it's <laughs> Do you guess? go ahead no no that's happening in so many industries like you could have kind of a, a reverse uh family tree of all these different companies just all getting consolidated mm -hmm. into like three or four uh, and that's happened. I mean, and defense contractors has happened. In te well, telecom, it was just one. It got split in a bunch and yep. then it's back to like yep. two. <laughs> yep. The, uh, what I was going to, do you guys remember? I don't, I, they haven't done these. I haven't seen this in a long time, but there used to be in Silicon Valley, they would give you a, somebody would make this calendar and a very small portion would be a calendar, but what it would have would be a picture, a cartoonish picture of the Valley and then yep. all the different businesses and it would change every year, but like over time, like, you know, you would, it was just like seeing the evolution of the Valley, like seeing your business on there. And by, by market cap or how? <laughs> no, you just buy, you would buy, I think you just no, no, like buy the, your, the, the scale. Yeah. No, no. It yeah. wouldn't even really be like that. But do you guys remember those at all? Oh yeah. I remember having one because I was in, I, I, out of school. I went to, I went to Austin instead of the Bay area mm -hmm. and I, I had one for the Bay area and one for Austin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at one point, and then I remembered a couple of years later, I found a website that had a bunch of these and it was just amazing to scroll through them because it's like, wow, that it, it, it the way I remember it. And now I probably remember it wrong because of the TV show, Silicon Valley. That was but, exactly what yes, I was going to say the, next. The intro, right? the, the intro to Silicon Valley, I think was based on these graphics. Yeah. It, it was such like a it. fun intro and, 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 and season to season, you could see things changing or getting and, built and that, or getting and that, torn down. And that, that's how these, that's how these calendars were. It was like, yeah. if you go, like, I would look at one from like 1998. It's like, holy cow, none of these companies exist anymore. Like in 2000, it was like, yeah. none yeah. of these companies Yahoo. exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe Yahoo still exists. <laughs> in, in some shape or form. Does it though? <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's big in Japan. It's really big in Japan. But like the thing is, like if you work for Yahoo here in the United States, but then you work in for you know you transition or transfer to the Japan office, now you work for Excite. That's super confusing. <laughs> it, the, the, I mean, there's a lot of those. But yeah. I do like the Yahoo cafes, like in Japan. I haven't been there in a long time, but <laughs> maybe I'll go check them out again soon. I'm going to take the opportunity to mention the capacitor company 
Um, and since we're a reverse engineering podcast and, and you're, uh, I, I, I think I first met you as a capacitor wizard at a, I think it was an HEDG, like the Hackaday Developers yep. Galactic Galactic in San Francisco. Yep. Which has and been you, since renamed. <laughs> well, no, like uh, the, Gamal was running most of yeah. that, I think for a while. And, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, you gave a whole talk on capacitor, like it, it was super interesting. I was just wondering if someone is reverse engineering a circuit and, you know, a lot of capacitors, you know, big electrolytics, all those, they have labels, just look at it. Yep. If it doesn't, what are some things people should know? Do you just take, did you have to remove it? Do you use a, um, what kind of meter oh. should you use? All that yep. stuff. Do you lick it? What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, the most common unlabeled capacitors are cer multi-layer ceramics. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, if it's, if it's a tantalum, a tantalum polymer, aluminum polymer, those almost always have markings of some type. And so you can usually find a data sheet for those to explain whatever's on them. Um, and they'll usually have the voltage, the cap, and then a, a lot date code. So, um, so that, that information you can usually find even on, I mean, not until you get down to the, um, 0402. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, but those aren't really that popular on the electrolytic side. Um, yet. So on ceramics, uh, the only way to know is you've got to take it off the board and measure it. However, uh, you have to remember with class two ceramics. So that's the ones that have dielectrics like X7R and X5R. Mm -hmm. um, in order to remove them from the board, you, if you, you know, use hot air to desolder them, they will, they will uh, experience their curie point, which will reset their aging effect. And so with, um, with uh, class two ceramics, they're made with barium titanate. Barium titanate does a phase change at its curie point, like I think all things do. Um, and it's a, I, I always forget which direction it goes, but basically the, the, the structure of the molecule shifts. And then over time, it shifts back. And as it shifts, its permittivity actually goes down. And so when you hit it with the, when it hits the curie point, it has a really high amount of capacitance. And then over time, it relaxes. Um, what so is that manuf time, like, if so you, if you do, what's the amount of time it takes to reset it? That is a great question. Um, the Half time frame, <laughs> it, <laughs> no, the no. time frame is no, yeah, yeah. Um, the time frame is logarithmic, and mm -hmm. so we it goes by decade hours. So every decade hour, so one, ten, one hundred, one thousand, ten thousand, one hundred thousand, it loses depending on what the manufacturer says. Let's just call it three percent. So it'll start at certain value and then um, 10 hours later, it'll be down 6% from that point. Um, and so for most manufacturers, they have a referee time of about of a thousand hours. So they say after hitting Curie, the, the capacitor will not be in its rated capacitance until a thousand hours have passed. Um, and so I mentioned that because if you hot air reflow and remove the cap and then go measure it on an LCR, which is basically the only choice you have, um, you just have to keep in mind your capacitance could be as, as much as 10% higher than what the intended capacitance was supposed mm -hmm. to be. And just, rem just another reminder related to that is, you know, a lot of people think if you look at the tolerance for passive components, mm -hmm. so, you know, everything has like a 5% tolerance plus or minus 5%. Um, for some reason, engineers always seem to assume that it's a Gaussian curve and it's not, it's bimodal. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? They want to usually sell you the ones on the left side, right? <laughs> they, they, ah. they want to sell you the ones that are less than or yeah. the, the negative side uh, because the positive side can get bend into the next, um, next wider bin. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. So basically what I'm getting at is if you take a cap off and you measure 12 microfarads, it's probably a 10 microfarad cap um, that actually has a capacitance of about eight. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, that's something like that I remember that was a big part of your presentation was explaining this process. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, like if you desolder it, you just reset it. And I, I wasn't sure if like you just multiply it like by 90.9 mm -hmm. or, or, or just you yeah. know, wait, uh, <laughs> wait yeah, a, I mean, a couple yeah, of days. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it just takes a little bit of common sense. Mm -hmm. If it's not on the E, if it's not an E20 or an E12 value, then you you know, just pick the next lowest one and that's going to get you pretty close. Mm -hmm. Um, so. And is there any way to figure out what the voltage ratings are? <laughs> no. <laughs> so just like at the voltage rails that they're on and, and kind of guesstimate. Yeah. 
the, the so here, here I, I was gonna I was gonna draw this out longer, but let me just I just want to say this real quick about voltage ratings and capacitors. This okay. probably applies to other components as well, but I know it for caps really well. Um, the way that you come up with the rate of voltage for a capacitor is you 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 make the dielectric a certain thickness, mm -hmm. and your goal is for it to pass a a, a halt test, right? A highly accelerated life test. And so, for example, and I could be wrong, but I think the way that most ceramics do it is they say, okay, we're going to apply uh, 4x the rate of voltage at rate of temperature for 1,000 hours and then make sure that it doesn't parametrically fail. And so they basically tune their thickness of the dielectric to pass that qualification. And then from there, that's how they come up with it's a 10-volt cap mm -hmm. because they tested it at 40. Um and so the inherent problem with that is, you know, there's really nothing you can do to say, oh, well, if I apply 10 volts or 20 volts, how do I know What's what, the, what the rate of voltage is? Mm -hmm. My best suggestion is go look at, a, you know, assume it's X5R or X7R, to, you know, well, uh, just assume it's like an X5R cap and go look at what I call the waterfall table. Um, it's basically look at a manufacturer like Murata or Kemet. Uh, they'll have a table that's on the x-axis will be uh, capacitance. The y-axis will be voltage and kind of look for a case size that you're looking at and kind of guess that, mm -hmm. okay, you know, at 10 microfarads at the, in this case size, the maximum voltage is probably going to be like 6.3. Okay. And that's going to be how you could kind of figure out what the, the, and, um, and if you're reproducing, you could always overestimate, right? I guess just, just put a probably more expensive component, but we'll probably yeah. be fine. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's, that's kind of how, especially if you're trying to repair something, just uh, the, when I, when you're replacing caps for repair, always try to get the highest rate of voltage you can, regardless of whatever you think it's rated, rated for. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll just, I'll, I will mention if you really have to know what the rate of voltage is, then what you're going to have to do is remove the part, uh, cast it in resin and cross section it, measure the thickness of the layers and then compare it to known thicknesses. The only problem is if you're using commercial rated parts that they may change the thickness over time, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that's like literally the only way you Expert could possibly mode. know is to measure the thickness of yeah. the dielectric. Is that the quickest you've ever given this talk before? <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the least I've ever talked about capacitors. Ever. <laughs> I just thought it was well, funny that it says capacitor wizard. And I'm like, what did you come dressed as? But you don't have to tell me. <laughs> so it, uh, I'm, again, I'm not trying to flex here, but when I was an FAE, um, yeah. our field application engineer, we used to always ask, you know, like, can we do a lunch and learn and let me talk about caps? And we would get so much pushback every single time that there's no <laughs> way you can talk for an hour about caps and nobody will want to listen. And we had one customer who we did like one, I did, I did one of these, we had four people show up and then the next one, there were like 40 and I was like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, but if, if, until you think about it, you're like, oh, it's just a capacitor. How how complex yeah. could they be? And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> much more than I thought. But we'll, yeah. we, we won't make you uh, talk more about them for now. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so let's switch it up. Let's go to oscilloscopes. I'm just thinking, like off the top of my head. <laughs> Gosh, where'd you get that idea? <laughs> <laughs> so um, oscilloscopes are some of the first uh, things that one might reach for when we're analyzing a circuit. Um, I know that's what I do. Alvaro definitely does that. So what are the lesser known do's and don'ts when using a oscilloscope? Um, Particularly number one on stuff we don't like the hardware that we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the number one thing I want to, I want to say, mm. um, and I even screwed this up in one of my videos and I wish I had, hadn't shown a measurement that I showed, um, float the device under test. Don't float your scope. Um, ah. you want your scope to have a good solid connection to earth ground, mm -hmm. um, because if something dangerous occurs, it is much cheaper to replace your scope than it is to replace yourself. Um, so whenever possible, float the target, not the scope. Mm -hmm. Um, now obviously there are like battery operated and isolated scopes and stuff like that, but I've seen too many horror stories of people putting an isolation transformer on their scope because it's just a little bit easier. Um, I think that's a terrible idea. Okay. And this is one measuring a device that's running at man's voltage, basically, right? Well, I mean, or yeah, that, that especially when running, if you're dealing with something with a yeah mains voltage, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, but even in low voltage DC stuff, you know, if you want to really power your device from a isolated 
power supply, like a bench mm-hmm. supply. Because if you accidentally touch ground to five volts, then you really have a short through ground, mm-hmm. like the actual ground. And that's, that can be bad. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, in that case, yeah, I get, so, and I think it's that case is why people want to float their scope. Cause they're like, well, that way I don't have to worry about it. It's like, yeah, ah, yeah. but it's better to float the the target instead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, there's exceptions, but that's, that's my number one thing. Yeah. Um, the, the more practical thing I would say when it comes to scopes is I cry a little bit every time I hear somebody say, well, I should use my scope to debug this, but I don't know how, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, cause I, cause I, especially like during COVID, I used to watch a lot of people live stream electronic stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just, in the back of my mind, I was always like, use your scope, use <laughs> your scope. What were, what were they um, doing to compensate the scope, for that? Luke. <laughs> I mean, ridiculously, uh, the, the, the thing is I see people use their DMM all the time and, yeah. you know, for a super quick check, that's fine. Uh, but and just to for a totally go in, and, and to go in total ramp mode, like power supplies, if you're designing a switch mode power supply and you only measure with a DMM, you're an idiot. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, because like I, I did a video on this where it's like, and people are like, oh, you're just making this up. I'm like, no. Like, I'm, like, I'm it. showing it. It's like this, my DMM said zero volts AC and there's a two volt. It's it's like, I'm sorry, a seven volt peak to peak signal on a five volt rail. So I'm like, it's going, how did, did I do that math right? It was, it was seven volt peak. That, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So five volt rail, seven volt peak, whatever that yeah. is. Um, and it's like, that's not the, anyway. So, but what I really want to stress is if you have a scope and you don't feel comfortable using it, uh, number one thing I think you should learn how to use is the trigger. Understand the difference between auto, normal, and single, mm-hmm. because I, that's another one I see people messing up is they they leave their scope in auto mode, uh, or auto auto sweep mode. Yeah, and it's like no, if you put it in normal, you would actually see the chip select happen, mm-hmm. and you could see almost how fast it's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and then learn how to use the trigger modes other than edge, and so. Even just if you learn, get get a if your scope has pulse width trigger, learn how it works, get a good feel for it because you can capture a lot of stuff with a clever pulse width trigger. Yeah. Um, and so, in order to learn it, don't need anything complicated. Complicated. Pick your favorite microcontroller board and have it output some patterns that you try to capture on your scope. You know, get get comfortable doing that kind of thing. Like like basically, it sounds like you're you're saying do a D to A output and just see like and have it arpeggiating put out random values or random levels and see whether you can figure out how to level trigger and capture what's happening yeah yep yeah you could do it you could do it you could go so far as to do a d to a i mean you can do a lot with even with the digital digital, like you know just just create little glitches and stuff Mm -hmm. i mean you know just it's a it's like get creative come up with like four or five things that you can just kind of do and then Mm -hmm. see if you can find it on your scope i would say i would add to this in that you know at least for the for more embedded people I work with, like if you can get them to use a logic analyzer, sometimes they're over relying upon that. And then they see that things don't work for one reason or the other. And they never switch over to an oscilloscope to see like, oh, this, this signal's actually really noisy or we're having interference or it's yeah. actually not I'm, at the level that I thought it was at. It's just- Yeah, yeah, just, just just levels. I mean, James mm-hmm. mentioned the, the the rise time of different mm-hmm. parts. I exactly. mean, that's one way to, to sometimes I2C, if, if you don't have a good enough pull-up or there's too much capacitance on the yep. bus, on the logic analyzer, it might seem okay, but maybe yep. you're out of spec. Or it's super ripply because, yep. you know, whatever, it's overshooting, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you know, from a debug perspective, a signal that ripples when it, you know, rises, okay, the ripple there is not necessarily going to hurt your measurement or even operation, but your EMI guy is not going to be happy (laughs) when, when they run their probe over it. So, you know, it's like, you know, like you're saying, like the logic analyzer make all that stuff look great. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I totally agree on that. Is I, I think people get over reliant on their logic analyzer, and I think it's easy to forget that it's lying to you. It's they, it's, they all, lie. it's everything's it's, it's analog. It's not telling you the truth. It's tell it's the, it, yeah. It, like a lying, it's, it's cheating distorted. boyfriend. <laughs> well, I was gonna, you know, it's it's sort of like it's sort of like social media. It gives you a really nice picture of what you think it should look like. <laughs> yes, your logic analyzer is the glamour shot of. 
<laughs> it's the Instagram of the test and measurement it's, world. It's the filtered, <laughs> it's the glamour filter. <laughs> I think I have a new video title idea. <laughs> there you go. The, it's, it's Kardashianizing all your signals. Yeah. <laughs> the Kardashian filter. <laughs> but, but this just made me think of like, it would be neat to have even just a firmware image um, uh, for the uh, Pico, for example, mm -hmm. for the RP2040 yep. with various signal outputs. And then it's like, hey, load this on. And then here's your 10 different things you need to do with a scope. Mm -hmm. And then it's like stepping like challenges right quick tutorial <laughs> it, yeah. But, but, yeah that like a capture that would be a neat thing to have yeah mm -hmm. like to just get these captures um and, and then at the end you're like now you're now you're an, an expert or, or, or mm -hmm. now, now you know enough to be dangerous <laughs> no not well, dangerous i mean we <laughs> people do that with firmware right you yeah. do your hello world um yeah and, and 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 then you just start adding and adding, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's something that's missing from the oscilloscope world, um, a, a set of, of signals that is like how because you, you know what if you have a periodic signal? What if you have mm -hmm. a very uh, like you say maybe there's a glitch that happens randomly? Mm -hmm. Then you do your pulse. Then you uh, or when you want to do single when you uh, that mm -hmm. that would be a cool cool thing to yeah the the oscilloscope challenge <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. Oh, my cat just woke up. <laughs> Hi, cat. <laughs> they, back here, like they just like hang out back here, <laughs> and then they pop out. Sorry. Well, and you were seeing Jen's new new setup. Uh, the, the the previous recording locations for closets. <laughs> I mean, this is still a closet. It's still. A closet. It's a bigger closet. It's a very big closet. Like, there's still like a lot of space back here. All right. I, I, well, <laughs> anyway. yeah. One thing we, we ask everyone that's, that's on the show is what is your favorite tool? And it doesn't have to be reverse engineering related, but just in general, what, what what's your favorite tool? Um, I don't know that this necessarily qualifies, but I'm going to, I'm going to use it anyway, is a uh, uh, blue masking tape. That absolutely um, qualifies. I, my favorite way I, of fixing things. <laughs> it, it's, it's to me, it is, you know, everyone jokes about duct, duct tape. It's fine. And that it's great stuff. I have rolls of it. Gaffer's tape. It's great stuff. I have rolls of it, but I use blue masking tape on everything. I, it, when I was live streaming, that was the joke is how many different ways could I use blue masking tape? Because <laughs> I just, yeah. So without it's, any question, I always have a roll. Like when I go to conferences, I always bring a roll of masking tape because like uh DEF CON is fantastic for this. Is yeah. You almost always have to tape up one of the exposed terminals. It's like <laughs> something. I'll, I also use it as a, as a way to tighten up my lanyards so that they fit better. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. Oh, you just, just anyway. do a loop. Yeah. 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 I just loop around a little bit and it's like, I always bring like, I don't, well, DEF CON, I take a, a, a entire roll because it's DEF CON. It'll, but it'll get used. Yeah. Other places I just take a strip of it, like, um, on a piece of plastic or something mm -hmm. and then use it up. So, okay. so yeah, so, so my pick on that one is a uh, duct tape. Oh, oh damn it. <laughs> Blue, <laughs> Blue masking tape. Blue masking, Blue tape. masking tape. And you, yeah. Cause I like right now it's like for, to hold my mic, uh, my mic arm, there's a metal plate and I hold that in tape with, with blue masking tape and then down here to keep this shelf because i had to like re-screw it in and reinforce it with more stuff like blue masking tape everywhere <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah okay well that's a good answer yeah we agree we concur okay <sighs> follow-up question and this is for all the money mm -hmm. i don't know did you bring any money elvro yeah. okay for <laughs> all the not, not money <laughs> <laughs> you're trapped on a desert island what one tool do you bring with you? I always, I always, I, well, it doesn't have to be a tool. Uh, what one thing every, do you bring with you? Every time you guys ask people that question, that question, I've thought, I'm glad I don't have to answer that. Um, <laughs> well, you fool, you came on um, the show. <laughs> however, yes. however, I, I was, it just happened yesterday. I was talking to some friends about uh, certain tools and I realized a uh, hot glue gun is mm. my answer. Because mm -hmm. I think with a hot glue gun, you can pretty much build whatever you need. Yes, yeah, a three D printer. To, to, yeah, it, it, it's yeah, that's all a three D printer is, right? It's a CNC <laughs> glue gun. Um, so yeah, so hot glue gun. Um, and of course, being an engineer, I'm going to not 
ask the question of what about power and all that yeah. stuff. But, that, that's taken yeah. care of. It's a solar yep. powered yeah. glue gun. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just, but I was thinking about, it was like, you know, because originally I was going to say I, I would want to travel with a table saw and router. <laughs> a shaper. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, I just, well, I check it in. The professor, <laughs> the professor somehow like managed to do lots of stuff with coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And and if he could hot glue them together, he could probably have done more. I think yes. he did because he did build a radio and some other stuff. So like <laughs> yeah. clearly he had a C and C boat because those those coconuts were flat. I I just you know, I I sorry, I just my favorite thing about Gilligan's Island was how many times they got off the island for something and then got back on, right? Because you know, <laughs> at, end of the show they had to come back. But it's just like boy, that was like, such a weird premise. Can't, yeah. <laughs> I can't let you leave. Oh my god! Okay, <laughs> there's viewers. Yeah. <laughs> Who? By the way, did you guys hear about like how like every week there would be people that would call in to like the ra- not the radio station. They would call into like the police stations and stuff, saying like, "There's these people trapped on an island." <laughs> <laughs> Must have been early days. It was the early days. <laughs> Because I know it happened with War of the Worlds, but mm-hmm. that's a different... Yeah, I remember I remember reading about that. Don't worry, people aren't that smart, it turns out. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Maybe right. I shouldn't have said that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Our listeners are extremely... Bright. Very smart for tuning in each week and learning about capacitors. Each week? Each week? <laughs> Yeah. Well, oh, that's now? a bombshell of an announcement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're going to catch up. I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> Turn in each couple of months. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be back to our, our, our monthly cadence. At our least regular next year. cadence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, our, our usual. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, where can people, where do you want to be found online? We talked about all the socials, but <laughs> where, where yeah. should people find you? You know, I'll keep keep it simple. If you want to find more stuff from me, go to baldengineer.com. Easy. That's everything else yeah. will be there. Yeah. I, I probably have links to everything there. Probably. Including the the, the blue the, Unity Blue, Unit Blue. <laughs> Unity Blue, yes. <laughs> Unity Blue. Oh still. <laughs> I don't know. The cat's really happy to hear you guys though. All right. Well, I think <laughs> this was this is so much fun. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I, I I guess we can be found online somewhere. Uh, so, Jen. so yeah. So break it. I did the intro. So now you got to do the. Outro. Oh yeah, uh, I'm Alvaro uh, Alvaro P. dot com, and you can go from there. Uh, Unnamedre dot com. Um, I we're on Mastodon X, I think Twitter same. A name uh, show on Twitter. Yeah, a name underscore show. That's right. And, but and, we're not really doing a whole lot there unless we're setting up shows. Well, we'll apparently. just post episodes. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. How about you, Jen? Uh, you can find me at Rebelbot Jen on Mastodon and Blue Sky, and technically still Twitter, although that's not where I primarily want to be found. You could probably also find me on what's that thing called? Threads? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my god. <laughs> you know, I, I I keep forgetting that I have one of those accounts. Why? I well, just. It, it, it reminds me that I have one. I'm like, I should yeah. have clicked on that because I don't use it. It still tries to get me to click on that because like I yeah. have to do voiceover stuff and it's like, I don't want to do social media here, but like it keeps going like threads and I'm like, I click on something. Like, yeah, you could join threads and see this thing. And I'm like, no, I just, I just want to be where my friends are really. Yes. Yep. <laughs> They're not on threads is what, what I'm hearing from you. <laughs> so the, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, Mastodon, I think, I think we're at this point, all of us are almost all of us are on InfoSec Exchange or Chaos server? Social or, or something. Yeah. I don't know. Nobody can figure just, out. Just, just go to unnamed RE. Yeah. yeah. Or, or Gen Rebel Bot Gen. Yeah. Yeah. We'll find us somehow. All right. Uh, I guess it, that's. No, oh, no, no, you're not done. There's a whole list of things. Oh, shoot. Oh, no, no. So admittedly, we haven't been doing much, guys. <laughs> So, but if you like what we're doing, sometimes you can join our Patreon where we have a discord and maybe some stickers or something. And I don't know, you can talk to people, including our current guest about oh, yeah. whatever. Did you know that? <laughs> You've been recruited to our discord. <laughs> 
<laughs> the benefits are endless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wow, this has been a really rough coming back to podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> that that muscle goes really quickly, doesn't it, Alvaro? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, never had it, but yeah. so so yeah. So there's there's a pe- Patreon. You'll be able to find it from our website. And um, what else? Oh, Alvaro, what's the last thing on the list here? Oh, <laughs> if you like what you hear, <laughs> please leave a review somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> anywhere <laughs> good yeah. bad we'll i don't it. know <laughs> make suggestions for future guests <laughs> yeah okay, well, there you go okay okay well dramatic piano <laughs> goodbye everybody <laughs> it was so good to hear from all of you thank you james it was wonderful thank you guys <laughs> thank you alvaro <laughs> all right bye stop recording